All right, so we're moving now into a question session. Uh, we'll do about 10 minutes of questions and then we'll segue into our first big discussion um, where we'll be using the Google Jamboard. So uh, for the Jamboard, I mentioned this earlier, it's easiest if you're on a computer. So if you're currently watching on a tablet, now would be a time to that you may want to transition over uh, to a computer. All right, there's a number of questions here in the chat. Alex, there's one for you. I'll give you some time to read that one. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to pop back up to a conversation about localization. And uh, Caleb, I know that you maybe had some comments in the chat about that. You know, folks on the call may not all be familiar with the challenges of localization on the moon. Um, would you mind speaking to that and what that challenge is? Um, sure. I, I'm not an expert in this, but last I heard, uh, there wasn't a lot of um, certainty that there would be uh, precise localization available to the astronauts on the surface uh, while they were exploring during, um, say, Artemis three, and so there, there there's um, concern that I think Fred and others in the chat have raised that this is going to potentially be a real problem for placing the astronauts in context of the mapping that we do um, beforehand. And I just pointed out that you know the the lighting is also going to be a problem that you know at these sites where it's like less than ten degree. With solar illumination, it becomes especially challenging to pick out where you are relative to landmark potentially. And so um, that, that that's kind of the, the way I'm thinking about localization. Yeah, I think that's something we often take for granted, right? We know where we are. And these days you can just pull out your phone and see where your little blue dot is. And that's not going to be the case here. Um, Isaac, there's some questions for you in the chat. Uh, a question about um, specific numbers of hazards or how you defined uh, hazards. Uh, let's see, do you have specific numbers on your hazards? How big of a crater maybe constitutes a hazard? How big is a hazardous boulder? Um, can you talk a little bit about how you built that product and what you identified as a hazard? Yeah, so for those uh, terrain obstacle maps, uh, we identified everything when, when we went through the 5K geologic mapping, uh, we used a standard of 30 meters across for the craters. Uh, and when we digitize those, uh, we essentially just carry that over into the specialized mapping. Um, obviously, where these maps are iterative, uh, we can go back through and re-identify new standards. Uh, but for that product specifically, uh, craters were 30 meters across. Uh, we did not digitize uh, boulder fields uh, at this time. Uh, we have a another student uh, here at Tennessee Tech. Uh, a team member uh, with Dr. Luna and I, Tony Lamantia, who is uh, doing boulder field mapping. Uh, and once we get a data set for that, you know, we'll throw that into the terrain obstacle map as well. Um, and in regards to the slope, uh, we use the A3GT standards uh, that were defined uh, where 20 degrees and greater are untraversable. Uh, and so we just broke down that green to red gradient as green is anything 10 degrees or less in slope. Uh, anything in that unrestricted to with caution uh, is 10 to 19.9 degrees of slope and anything 20 degrees and greater is red. Thanks, Isaac. And I'm going to have a proud professor moment here. Isaac and Tony did such an incredible job. It's been really, really hot here in Tennessee this summer, and they were just cranking away at mapping in our nice, cool, dark computer lab. So um, absolutely awesome, awesome jobs. Uh, I left Tony alone at one point, and I came back a few days later, and I think he'd mapped something like 6,000 boulders. So stay tuned for some GSA presentations. Um, Alex, there's a question here. Uh, have you applied a uh, tactical mapping to Apollo Traverse sites to estimate time on task for sampling stations and then compare that estimate to the actual time the astronauts spent at a site, maybe a, a way to get at some ground truthing. Yeah, great idea. I have not applied that, but that would be a good way, um, especially as we're going forward with the JET 5 team of planning our traverses and assigning certain time uh, limits for certain actions and seeing how even for that uh, field site and Flagstaff, how that changes over the course of an EVA, but using that with something um, with the Apollo sites as a way to um, test those processes. So I, I would be interested in trying that, but no, I have not. Just to jump in on that one really fast, that there, there has been some work on that at ASU. Um, uh, somebody presented a really cool uh, work, um, maybe at a league or a uh, uh, recent lunar meeting. Um, uh, doing time study uh, analysis. Um, but somebody in the chat, if they remember who that was, please add it in. Great. Yeah. Alex, I have another question for you here, too. Um, you know, when we're trying to incorporate all of these different data sets, I think one 
one challenge of mapping is that we don't want to make the product overwhelming, right? We want an astronaut or a user, or whoever, whoever is using that product, not to find it so confusing that they can't use it. So it looked like you were incorporating a lot of different pieces. You know, do you have any guiding principles for how to keep map products from getting too overwhelming for a potential user? Yes, that is something that um, we are testing with Jet5 because the level of de detail from Jet3 to Jet5 in the maps has increased. Um, and what does that mean for when you're trying to communicate the map and its products and the science and the STN to crew and to flight directors and the teams that are planning the traverses? And it can get overwhelming real fast. Um, I think that it comes down to, you know, clearly and concisely explaining what each of the products mean beforehand and as part of crew training, but then also streamlining those products. So I talked about how you mix and match depending on what the use case is. And for, you know, the crew will have map books and they'll have cuff checklists and making sure that you don't put every data set, every tactical map that you have available all on that, but filtering based on what is the primary science objective at each station, for example, or scientific point of interest. Um, but I guess, in summary, just keeping your use case in mind and uh, having, I guess, a, I always like to write reports, so a report that summarizes what everything is. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's always a challenge. I find that I put too much on a map and then I need to go back and take some stuff off. Um, okay, there's a question from Hannes in here for me. Uh, in the regional de Gerlach map, which data sets do we base the Shackleton Crater Ejecta? Right now they're based on the DEM, but uh, I would say of that regional map, we are least happy with the, you know, mapping is iterative, okay, first of all. And of that entire map, the area in that Shackleton Ridge, we are not particularly happy with. We want to go back and remap that. And Hannes, I know you've got a presentation this afternoon um, showing a high resolution, what we would consider a local or specialized map over that same area. So uh, we should chat and try to clean up some of that. Uh, the, there were also some questions in the chat here about, um, different projections and i think those have been it looks to me like those have been answered uh i believe they've been answered about what types of projections are currently available and because we're going back to the moon there's a lot of stuff that's currently in development so um right now we're kind of using what we have but we are always happy to get more data that's that's the chorus that we all sing and we're always happy and that data can include different projections um, let's see, is there any scale for suitability of landing or sampling site that's been developed um, from tactical maps? So Alex, I think this would probably get at some of your JET-5 work. So uh, any scale for suitability of landing or sampling site, um, you know, how... Yeah, I'm just going to leave, I, I'm trying to think of how to interpret that question. Um, suitability of landing or sampling site developed from tactical maps. And Namishka, if you want to add a little bit more information in the chat, uh, that would be really helpful for us. I hear that as like, which scale maps do you produce to be most useful? Um, uh, the maps that we made for Jet 5 are at 1 to 5,000 scale. And Kelsey showed insets, so point, uh, science points of interest circles that were 100 meter diameter circles as like what might be graduated into a station if they're included on the traverses. And that was something that we were looking at to see, do we need higher fidelity mapping at specific points of interest or stations? And we're finding that the fidelity of the one five to 5,000 scale map is good. And you could add more, but that comes to that trade-off that we were talking about earlier, Jeanette, of when is it too much? So it's actually a really nice level of detail if you're not in like a very wide plains <laughs> um, for what crew might expect when approaching uh, those stations. So one to 5K is what we're running with, but we'll be testing it in the field this fall. Okay, th I think that's really good to know. So one to 5K. Um, there's also a question in here about competitive mapping. And I know anyone who has participated on A3GT, um, yeah, there's a little bit of a competitive mapping that maybe went on for some proposal development. Um, but I think the bigger part of the question here is, you know, how do we intelligently team or define boundaries based on shared or conflicting interests? And I think that is a much broader discussion that we can have as we move through the meeting. Um, the last question that I'll take down here, uh, Alex, the JET5, do, are they currently evaluating heads-up displays 
as a possibility for astronaut use? Um, I, for Jet 5, we are not doing that. And I don't want to speak for what they're planning for Artemis, but for Jet 5, we're not going to be having that. They'll have print uh, map books. Okay, great. And it looks like Jim has also put a, um, a answer there in the chat.